So graphene is a two-dimensional form of graphite discovered in 2004 by Novikov and Geim. They got the Nobel Prize in 2010 and you would have thought it would take over the world and it was poised to do that. So there's a big question, well why didn't it? Well one of the major reasons it didn't is because the early ways of making it were downright dangerous. They used 98% sulfuric acid and they used potassium permanganate which made an explosive compound. Now, if you do a little bit of that, that's not a worry, but if you do tons of that, well you could just create a big pit the size of Massachusetts. So it was a big worry for everybody. And that was one of the things that was kind of holding it all back. But of course, research goes on. And some really interesting ways have been found to create graphene. Now I'm really keen on people doing stuff at home and experimenting and discovering for themselves. So I've had a look at what there is going and chosen two methods which I think, well anybody could do. Graphene is the strongest material known to man and when you get down to the level of the atom it looks like chicken wire laid out. It's so strong that a tiny amount can significantly improve the properties of plastics, paints, composites, asphalt, wood composites, concrete, metals and all kinds of things. It only has one slight problem and that is it's crazy expensive. It's about $200,000 a ton or something like that. And the reason is it's difficult and dangerous to make. It uses, oh, hideous chemicals, things like 98% sulfuric acid, not stuff you're going to want to be handling. And the product is disappointing. It's not really graphene. It's often referred to as graphene, but it's fuel layer graphene, or it's pretty damaged, or it's pretty small. So it's been disappointing until about 2013 when rice came out with something called flash graphene and flash graphene was a method of making graphene supposedly easily. The setup is surprisingly simple, it's a couple of brass rods stuck in a glass tube with the sample in between them and as you can see from the circuit diagram we have a power supply that charges up a capacitor bank and then we get a switch that allows that power to go through the tube and what you see is a very bright light. In that bright flash is the release of the energy and what happens is the temperature is raised to about 3000 degrees Kelvin in about 10 milliseconds. That kind of time means that the heat transfer can't go out of the sample. It all stays in that sample because it's just too quick. The first thing that happens is it carbonizes. The next thing that happens is it reforms into graphene and true enough it's a marvelous operation. But it does have some hidden things in there that make it very difficult to do at home. And one of them is that little thing capacitor bank on the circuit diagram we looked at. That capacitor bank actually consists of about 20 capacitors. It's 0.22 farads capacitance at 400 volts. So it's also lethal. You might have noticed the danger sign. It's also expensive. Those individual capacitors themselves are quite expensive and to build a capacitor bank probably costs somewhere around about three to four thousand pounds. So I think it's a little outside of what we could do easily at home, although in industry of course it could be done easily, especially if you have the money to spend on capacitors. But flashing graphene with electrical energy for capacitors isn't the only way to flash graphene. You can also flash it with light and this is a 20 watt diode laser. Now you only need about 3.6 watts and the original work was done with the CO2 laser although it's since been discovered that diode lasers work just fine. Now it came about when Dr. Kerner was looking at flash scribing graphene oxide and he was making capacitors out of that. Tour tried to replicate that and made a mistake and what he did was flash this stuff, capped on tape. And he found that if you flash capped on tape then you've got two kinds of graphene on there. One was a spongy kind of graphene and if you changed this you got a rod kind of graphene because what you do is you do multiple passes. It takes about three passes. The first carbonizes the capton, the second reforms it and the third helps the graphene grow. So passing this a number of times will make the graphene grow in a space
spongy form. That's if the light is focused. If you defocus the light, then every time you move a spot, you are effectively multi-lasing an area and you get a needle-like growth by defocusing the light. Now, when they um, discovered that Capton worked quite well, of course, they went on to other things. And now they've discovered that you can actually scribe graphene onto a whole host of things, including uh, paper, wood, a range of plastic. So, in order to create a supercapacitor, flashing it with a laser, then you need a laser that is between 405 and 450 nanometers, which basically means every laser you're ever going to get, because that means either a diode or CO2. Either will work. It doesn't matter how powerful the laser is, as long as at a minimum you can put 3.6 watts optical power out there, which is pretty much every single laser you're going to buy. So it's really unrestrictive about what laser you're going to be able to use. Just about anything you can buy is going to pretty much do the job. And we used a cheap Banggood laser, which I think cost me about £145, and it was uh, a 5 watt laser, and we got a beautiful result. So anything is going to be able to do it. All you do is you draw a drawing in your drawing package. Now, the famous one is interdigitation, which is basically fingers that interlock with each other. You draw that up in your drawing package and you're going to lay something. Now, the first thing that was lazed was this stuff, capped on tape. Capped on tape is dead easy to use, produces a brilliant result, and that's why I talked about it. But of course, people now they've discovered you can laze graphene have been doing all kinds of things. The tour group have done coconuts and potatoes. Then you find a lot of people doing, oh well, paper and wood, all sorts of stuff. Paper is extremely interesting to me, but of course, if you get a bit of paper and you laser it, all that'll happen is it'll burn. So you need to do something to the paper to prevent it burning. And what you do is soak it in a fire retardant. The easiest fire retardant to use is probably borax. So sodium tetraborate. You soak your paper in sodium tetraborate, dry it, then the next day it's ready to laze. You laze it by drawing an interdigitated pattern in your laser program, loading it up, sticking the thing underneath the laser and turning the laser on. Okay, that's what came out of the laser. Actually, I think that's really quite impressive. It's got a real graphitic look to it, but that actually has formed a graphene. It's a spongy graphene because we've got an explosion in there, but you can see it looks really graphitic. And now we need to test that as a supercapacitor, but that laser has done an awesome job. Okay, so I've got it on this capacitance meter, which is a Rigol DM3058, it's a pretty decent meter. All I've done is connect a couple of aluminium strips onto it so it can make good contact. And all by itself, without electrolyte, it's around about uh, a nanofarad, 1.078 nanofarads. Now, um, that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you consider what it is, actually, that's really quite impressive. Because um, something that was physically this size, but two plates of aluminium, will be around about 35 picofarads. So it's a lot more, maybe about 100 times more or something like that. All ballpark figures, but really very much more than it would be just as a plate capacitor. And of course, that's to do with the surface area of the graphene. Now, I haven't added any electrolytes, and I'm going to put a bit of tissue paper on it and a little bit of electrolyte, and we're going to measure the capacitance of that. So we bang a bit of electrolyte on it, and we get 6.5 microfarads. Now, again, that might not sound a lot, I mean, microfarads, but remember, it's supposed to be picofarads. Without electrolyte, it's in the sort of nanofarads. With the electrolyte, we're getting microfarads for that tiny piece of material. Now, obviously, there's a fair bit of playing around to it, but 
That is really quite a cool result. Okay. But it really is! That simple! All you need is a desktop laser and some of this stuff and you're away. I mean, obviously, there's a lot can be done with it. You could try different patterns, you can stack them up, you can see how it works on a whole field, you can try different electrolytes. There's just such a ton of stuff you could do with it to create your own storage devices for, well, the trouble of doing it, really. And that's one of the things I like about it so much, is it opens the possibility for experimentation and building to anybody and everybody, which makes it brilliant as far as I'm concerned. So as a dry method, flashing it, it's awesome. I mean, there's no waste materials, there's no chemicals, there's no disposal. It does have its issues. That is, you only produce what you want to produce and it's already in a structure. Sometimes you would want basically a bucket load of it because you might want to do other things. And that really means a wet method. Now, wet methods can be pretty scary, but not this one. So the average price of graphene these days is in the region of $200,000 a tonne or so. And that seems like a lot of money, particularly when you think about the average price of graphite, which is in the region of $150 to $350 a tonne. So there's a big price difference between the two, and it seems quite attractive. But when you think about it a little bit, then a tonne, remember, is a 1,000 kilos. And I've got about half a kilo of graphene right there. So that's only about $100. And when you use it, of course, you don't use that much. So it's one of the big reasons why making your own graphene has fallen by the wayside. Because making your own graphene in small amounts, well, it requires some pretty difficult and dangerous and expensive chemicals. And then, of course, if you're socially conscious, you have to dispose of all the waste properly. So it can get more expensive to make it than it is to buy it, which is a curious thing. I actually still make my own. However, if there were a simple method of making it that was easier and cheaper, clearly it would be so much cheaper to make. And of course there is one. It's what Gein did at the beginning when he put a bit of sellotape on a lump of graphite and peeled it apart and apart. So the issue isn't making the graphene, it's making lots of the graphene. Now in video 1932, we looked at a methodology for making graphene in layers to attach to a background. Now that's really, really useful for certain applications. You know, things like batteries, supercapacitors, heat pads, um, speakers, that sort of thing. Brilliant, because it comes already made for you to do something with it. You don't have to do things like clean it and mix it with the glue and stick it on. It's all just ready to use. And of course, it would be nice if there was a way to make a volume like that. There was also cheap, simple, and effective and easy to use because then you could use it in things like oh the epoxy resins maybe like uh, what's his face did tech ingredients uh, concrete you could use it in maybe put it on the plastics that sort of thing so a bulk method that was simple and straightforward would be absolutely brilliant that's where this comes in now <laughs> <laughs> the channel used to be about graphene, and I had a look through and counted the graphene videos. There's something like 198 graphene videos on how to make it and use it. So, of course, there are systems where we can actually do that. And perhaps one of the easiest ones was this. This is clearly a kitchen blender, and it was Trinity College Dublin who came up with this one. Because if you think about how Gaim did it, he was shearing off the graphene platelets from the graphite lump. And this thing, of course, right there has a shear. So if we stick some graphite in there with some water and turn it on, then it should shear. And it does. It creates shear and turbulence. The only problem is the graphene, as it peels off, once it goes straight back on again. And so you need to put something in there to help it peel off and to prevent it sticking back on. And what Trinity College Dublin did was use this stuff, washing up liquid. And we did a couple of videos on this method actually. And it does indeed produce high quality graphene that is easy to use if you want it in a liquid form. Because getting it out and cleaning it was a bit of a nightmare. However, Research never stops, does it? 
And this is from a paper called Kitchen Chemistry 101, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. So anybody who wants to read up on this can read up on it. And they were worried about the same kind of things. That is, making a graphene that was easy to get out into a powder form that wouldn't require a huge amount of washing or a huge amount of disposal cost. And they looked at three things. Blood, milk <laughs> and eggs. Turns out that the proteins in these materials will act in the same way as the dishwasher soap, with the huge exception of they're easy to get rid of. The proteins in these things are, are things like bovine, uh, bovine serum albumin, lactoglobulins, that's what you find in milk, and these you'll find lysosome and um, albumin and that's in the egg white and in blood you find haemoglobin and they practiced on these things and they found actually that the blood although it worked wasn't brilliant so I did think about going down to the abattoir and getting a pint of blood or even you know I suffer for my art some of my own blood but I decided in the end not to so blood and eggs work just not brilliantly the best thing that works is bovine serum albumin and lactoglobulins. Now in milk we've got three main proteins as well as lots of sugar and lots of water. We've got the lactoglobulins, we've got the serum albumin and we've got casein which is the stuff you find in cheese. So if you get some milk that has had the casein removed what you're left with are the two main proteins we're actually after and of course there is a product where they remove the casein, and it's this stuff, whey powder. This particular bag of whey powder is chocolate flavoured, but out of 100 grams of this, 71 grams of it is the proteins that we're looking for. Now in the research paper, what they found was, it was astonishing how lax you could be about this. I mean, sure enough, there were parameters in which it performed better, but it would work with a huge range of parameters, down from next to nothing to 100 grams of this per litre, down from 20 grams to 100 grams per litre of graphite. So it was just this massive range of what would work by sticking it in a kitchen blender to give you high concentrations of graphene in water, because a high concentration of graphene in water is something like three to four milligrams per milliliter. It's not a huge amount. And they were getting seven or eight milligrams per milliliter which is fast and they were getting it in half an hour. Okay so there really was just such a huge range that they used and all of them worked so if you read the paper you'll find out so we don't need to be that precise about this. So I'm going to add 500 milliliters of deionized water in there and 50 grams of my graphite. Now the graphite I'm using is this stuff. This stuff's actually really rather beautiful. It's about 150 microns across. They used anywhere between 45 to 250 microns. So again, the graphene platelet size isn't that important. However, the bigger the plate is, and the bigger your graphene sheets are, and the more conductive it is. So if you use quite a large graphite, then you're gonna find it works really quite well. And again, anywhere between sort of five grams and 50 grams is gonna work in that 500 milliliters of water. And then we add our proteins. Now this, remember, is bovine serum albumin and lactoglobulin, and we need about one and a half grams of protein in there for what we've added. So I'm just gonna put a teaspoon in. And again, it really doesn't matter the kind of numbers that we use. It is kitchen chemistry par excellence. Close that up, and we'll give that a blitz. Okay, we need to blitz it for about half an hour. And after half an hour, turn it off. Now, it will be foamy because we've put some stuff in there. What we need to do is leave it to separate and to degas. So the gas will just come out of the foam. The heavier particles of graphite are going to sink to the bottom and we're going to get a black layer in between, which is the graphene. So I've scraped off some of the foam and there it is. It's kind of a blue-black colour. Apparently it's stable in suspension for about two months. If you want to separate it out, you need to centrifuge it uh, 45 minutes at 1500 RPM. Now the proteins, which now 
coat the graphene, prevent it from restacking, so you'll get a dry powder that way. If you're going to use this, I wouldn't bother. I mean, it's already really nicely dispersed. Just chuck that in some sand and cement, and you're going to have yourself a graphene improved concrete. To prove that it's graphene, a graphene, well, you really need a Raman for that, and you're looking for the G and D bands. I'm going by what the paper said. The paper said it's graphene, and I have no reason to disbelieve them. But there we go. A tub full of graphene made from, well, blood, sweat and tears? No, no, blood, eggs and milk, and milk is the best. In the kitchen blender for half an hour. Don't think you're going to get a better, easier method for a little while yet. So, so it's a bit of a revelation if you think about it, because you can make graphene from a kitchen blender, water, graphite, and blood, if you really want to, milk or eggs. Turns out milk works the best. But I suppose if you're a vampire and you want graphene, blood is going to be your option. And we've got two choices here. We can either leave this as is and put it into something, or we can dry it. Now drying it's really easy. You just spin it up in a centrifuge at 1500 RPM for 45 minutes, set it out to dry, and what you'll get is a whole bunch of this stuff, which is graphene powder. Because there's graphene powder, we then want to do something with it. Now, tech ingredients mix this with an epoxy resin, but since it's a biocompatible, I thought I would mix it with a bio-based plastic. The earliest bio-based plastic we know of is casein. Casein's really easy to make at home, but it's one of those kids' experiments where you take some milk, and here's how you make it. Okay, when you've gone through that process, what you get is this white powder, and this is just powdered casein. Now what we do to that is add 0.5% of graphene powder to it. You really don't need to add a lot to get an enhancement. And we only added 0.5% because it was completely random, we just chose something. And it turns it into this silvery powder. And what we do with that is put it into a mould. Now a mould is really simple, it's just a press and a bit of steel, and you pour the powder into there and heat it to 135 degrees centigrade and then put about 20 tonnes on it, which is what this press is. When you've done that, you can take it out of the mould and there is our piece of plastic. Now this is incredibly strong. Let's give it a go of stabbing it and see how it holds up. It's been approached um, to see if it's usable for stab proofing. Uh, we're quite confident it is. So what I was going to do, I was going to use this brand new pristine piece. Um, but we've been having a go at this, uh, and I'll show you the results in a minute. But we're going to be using an off cut that we've got. And we've hit this sort of 30, 40 times so far. I mean, if you're unlucky enough to live in a world where you need stat proofing, that's bad enough. If you're even more unlucky and you need some protection against about 30 stat rooms, <laughs> then that's even better. So what I'll do, I'll get this down on the floor. We've got a solid concrete floor behind this. And I'll give it a go with a sharpened, this is sometimes used as a weapon actually, sharpened um, screwdriver. So I'm uh, 16 and a half stone. Fairly big guy, so I'm going to bring this down as hard as I can and we'll see how it performs. <laughs> I can't do this. Does somebody else want to have a go? Mike, do you want to have a go? Do <laughs> it, Mike. Go for it. Oh, oh, <laughs> Now you might have guessed from the footage, we did all of that some time ago, about seven years I think, and we actually sent it for testing and it turns out that volume for volume is about twice as strong as steel. Weight for weight, it's about 10 times as strong. And we also took it to a firing range and here's a bit we've got left. Now um, we fired a nine millimeter at it and a three millimeter thick plate of this would stop a nine millimeter bullet. So now everybody knows if you put graphene into concrete, you're gonna improve the strength of the concrete. But graphene in concrete has two intrinsic problems. The first one is 
getting it to disperse properly. If you add two powders together, mixing them up so you get proper dispersion is in fact quite challenging. The second one is, <laughs> it's really expensive. So you need to make it cheaply. Now I haven't bothered doing anything with this because of course what we've already got is a graphene dispersion in water. If all we do is put that into our dry cement mix, then we'll be able to disperse the graphene super, super easily because it's already dispersed. And of course we already know that making this stuff is unbelievably cheap and that's about seven milligrams per milliliter as a concentration. So all I plan on doing is pouring that straight into the concrete because of course that saves us a huge amount of trouble and effort because we don't want to dry it and all the processes involved with getting it out to have to remix it and all the processes involved in mixing it properly when it's already there. Now when you make concrete blocks for testing, they're actually standard sizes. They're four inches by four inches by four inches or six inches by six inches by six inches. And you make them in steel moulds. And once you've made those in steel moulds and you've got your concrete block, you can take that down to the test house and have it tested. And we did exactly that. So here it is in a test machine. So the load is now being applied to the top of the key. Okay. It just adds the, um, adds the weight and the pressure over a constant. Yeah, the constant. So uh, yeah. the cube concrete deforms. It's, it's slightly plastic as many things are. Yeah. You don't expect it to be, but it is. Um, <clears throat> and so as, um, as it's deforming, the mm -hmm. load is kind of catching up with it. Okay. So it's always a constant load based on what it's measuring. Okay. Now concrete isn't the same beast the world over. It has different properties, different strengths, obviously different costs, and it depends on the cement it's made from. Now there are five most popular ones that are used in just about every circumstance. And here are the results of graphene added concrete and all the other five concretes. It may not be immediately obvious, but that last one marked FWGCWM is the graphene added concrete that we made. And it is 58% stronger than any other concrete. Now you might have noticed it said seven day test, and that's because there are two tests. There's a seven day test where you leave it to cure for seven days, and then a 28 day test where it's been cured for 28 days, because concrete gets stronger over time as it cures from the first time it dries to when it's finally ready and cured. So it gets stronger over time. Now ours is stronger than every other seven day test. <laughs> What's more is the seven day cured concrete is stronger than everybody else's 28 day cured concrete. So this method at first sight doesn't seem like much, but when you look at it a little bit deeper, it suddenly becomes really, really exciting because of course this method is dirt cheap, really simple, remains in dispersion. So you can afford to just chuck it in your concrete and it increases the strength of the concrete by 58%. What that means is you can use a third less concrete in everything and a third less concrete is a huge amount of concrete when you think of all the concrete that's being used. And concrete is recognized as one of the biggest contributors. We can reduce the amount of contribution by one whole third. That's incredible when you think about it. Anyway, and this is graphene powder. It's a very special graphene powder actually because it's coated in protein molecules. And what that does is keep everything apart and stops the graphene going back to graphite. It also means that it's easier to break up and it's easier to put into other things. But you can't just put this into something and stir it with a stick because the real problem is dispersion. That is, getting it mixed properly, and that's quite challenging. 
Now if we want to put this into plastic, we need to use a process called master batching. Master batching is a complicated process because it's so difficult to break everything up properly to get proper dispersion. And companies go to a lot of trouble when it comes to master batching. They pour in the virgin plastic, they pour in the colour or other additives, give it a jolly good stir before they extrude it into pellet form. When you've done that, then you can get a good plastic with a good dispersion. If we're looking for improvement in strength, of course, we need that graphene to be well dispersed around the plastic. Now, we can't really do that without some expensive machinery. So, we sent this off to a master batcher. And then we had it extruded into standard dog bones for testing. Add graphene into anything and it makes it stronger. So what we have here is the graphene peak, uh, which we actually sent to the University of Limerick in Ireland. And they tested this for us, and they, in their own words, it was uh, unbreakable. And what they actually meant was their machines failed before our plastic did. Okay, so what we have here is the graphene uh, peak in a dog bone. So we put a, a nice little hook on here and a sling. It's just that little bit of plastic. Yeah. Not really. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay, I'm getting off. Okay. What? Oh, oh no! Yeah! Wow. <laughs> that's awesome! Wow. Oh, wow. Wow, indeed. I take two. Uh, the actual strap uh, broke, so uh, we've actually had to reinforce the strap, but uh, my 17 stone hopefully won't break. Wow! That is awesome! <laughs> Jump on, mate! Come on! Come on! Yeah, you get on first, mate. I'll join you. Go on. Okay. You right? Yeah? Well, I'm told so, okay? Right, I actually, the screw fell this time. The screw? No way! <laughs> yep. That's, mate, that's awesome. Yeah, that's actually stronger than that steel. <laughs> <laughs> so what's it done? Yeah, it's broken. 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 It's yeah. Anyway, the point of those shenanigans? Well, you mix the graphene in properly to a plastic and the properties are truly astounding. And we have had this stuff tested, so we do have some test figures, but there's nothing like getting a feel for it by swinging on it and not having it break. Everything else breaks around it. So graphene, the wonder material of our age, has been, to my mind, underused. And I think that's because, until now, it's been difficult, dangerous and expensive. But hopefully what we've seen is that there are at least two methods where it can be produced easily and in bulk. So I hope we've seen that it's actually easier to produce than you think. It goes in a huge range of materials, and we've had a look at some of those ways of putting that together, and the properties it gives materials are truly astounding. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching, and please do remember to like and subscribe.